And now it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Ruth Lanius, psychiatry professor at Harris Woodman Chair at Western University of Canada. Uh, she's director of clinical research program for PTSD. Ruth has more than 25 years of clinical and research experience with trauma. As she established Traumatic Stress Service at London Health Science Center, program that specializes in treatment of psychological trauma. Ruth has received numerous research and teaching awards, including Banting Award for Military Health Research. And Ruth publishes a lot. She published over 150 research articles and book chapters focusing on brain adaptation to psychological trauma and also to uh, new approaches to treatment of PTSD. Ruth regularly teaches on topic of psychological trauma, both nationally and internationally. She is co-author of two books, The Effect of Early Life Trauma on Health and Disease, The Hidden Epidemics, and also Healing the Traumatized Self, Consciousness Neuroscience Treatment. And for me, uh, Ruth, as a clinician and researcher, is a combination that is not often seen, that you have a great clinician with a great and deep understanding of uh, trauma and work with clients, and also a brilliant researcher. Uh, Ruth, we are really grateful for having you on board and, and having you as a champion for, for neurofeedback. It's really a um, great honor to have you with us today and also to give us the opportunity to thank you for work that you did for our field and for work that you are about to do as well. Because I believe that with having you on board and having your research to support what we do is giving the whole field more credibility. And um, I expect that in the future, we'll actually, as a field, progress much faster. Uh, and that is, also due to your research and work that you are doing. So welcome to Australian Conference, ANSA Conference, and we are looking forward to hear your keynote. Thank you so much, Mariana. It's a, such an honor to be here at the ANSA Conference, and uh, I'm so impressed with what you've done under your leadership in Australia with neurofeedback. The trainings and the clinical work you've done I think is so impressive and I really admired it. So uh, it's a real pleasure to be here today, virtually, of course. And so today I wanna talk about uh, alpha neurofeedback. That's a treatment we've been researching and really talking about reaching a new steady state after trauma and really moving towards the restoration of the self. And we have some hot new data off the press, uh, really looking at the mechanism of alpha neurofeedback and how this may be restoring the sense of self. And it's very much along what uh, Sieber has talked about recently that everything's about frequencies. And if we change frequencies, we allow, allow us to connect to ourselves and to others. And so I want to follow uh, what Seaburn has been talking about over the last several months. But to start with, I need to thank all my collaborators without whom this work would not be possible. And I'm really indebted to uh, Thomas Ross, who first brought neurofeedback to our group and we're still collaborating with him. Also Andrew Nicholson, who has done a lot of the analysis and more recently Saurabh Shaw as well. So without my group, this work would not be possible. So I just want to give you a quick overview of what we'll be talking about this morning. Um, first of all, we're going to review the clinical and neurobiological evidence underlying the sense of self after trauma. And then we're going to discuss how alpha neurofeedback can restore the sense of self and specifically what frequencies get restored that may be instrumental in really helping that sense of self come online. And then we're gonna talk about some recent work we've also been doing, which is really disseminating alpha neurofeedback as an adjunct treatment for indigenous populations in Canada. And here we're working very closely with Patricia Vickers, who's a wonderful therapist who did neurofeedback herself. 
and she's now bringing alpha neurofeedback into various indigenous communities in Canada. All right, let's start out with something that we all know, and that is how the sense of self is really severely affected in the aftermath of trauma, right? And of course, when we're thinking about developmental trauma, that sense of self frequently never developed. And if we experience trauma a little later on, often people's core issue in the aftermath of trauma is that I am not myself anymore, right? So either we don't have the sense of self ever developing, or we have a loss of the sense of self that is absolutely paramount to the experience of trauma. <laughs> we also know that there's a cognitive part of the self and a bodily part of the self. And I think when we talk about the cognitive self, it's just not, it's not just the cognitive sense of self, but it's the cognitive slash affective sense of self, as we'll talk about later on. And so how do people experience themselves as they talk about themselves cognitively? And often they say, I feel dead inside, or I always feel on edge, or I don't know myself anymore, or I'm bad, especially if they're experiencing a lot of shame, or I don't deserve to live, or the world will never be the same. And then, of course, trauma is also very much seated in the body, as we know, for example, from Bessel van der Kolk's book, The Body Keeps the Score. We also know from Sandy McFarland's research in Australia that there's a lot of physical symptoms that are very predictive in whether somebody actually experiences the more mental PTSD symptoms. And this is what Sandy McFarland's group, for example, found that People in the aftermath of trauma often complained about flatulence or burping or faster breathing than normal or feeling short of breath at rest or having a rapid heartbeat or feeling like your bowel movement is not finished or having pain in the face, in the jaw, in front of the ear or having lower back pain. And all those symptoms were very highly predictive of whether somebody actually had the more mental criteria associated with post-traumatic stress. But we also know that disconnection from the body is very common after trauma. Again, because so much pain is held within the body, often people dissociate and they may say, I feel detached from my body or I feel like my body no longer belongs to me, which would be very consistent with identity dissociation. Or I feel as if there is no boundary around my body. I don't know where I begin and I don't know where I end. <clears throat> and of course we know that brain, mind and body are intimately connected, right? That we can't, view one without thinking about the other. So how do we think about the sense of self? And you've heard from Seaburn about this. The default mode network is one brain network that is very active when the brain is in a resting state. So when we're not engaged in any particular activity. And this network may serve as a very important model for the sense of self. And I'll discuss why in a minute. So what are the functions of this default mode network that make it such a good model for the sense of self? Well, first of all, it's really involved in self-reflection in helping us really figure out what we're feeling inside. So going on this introspective journey and really going towards self-awareness. So this default mode network is absolutely critical in that. And of course, we need to know what we feel if we're going to have a coherent sense of self. This network is also critical for autobiographical memory. So remembering what we have experienced and of course, 
our experiences really define who we are. And this network is really critical in helping us perceive the perspectives of others and forming social bonds. And finally, this network is also critical in our feeling of being embodied. And as we talk about these different functions of the default mode network and trauma, very quickly we will realize that all these functions of the default mode network are severely impacted in the aftermath of trauma. And this may be one reason, this disruption in this network, why the sense of self is so affected after trauma and why it never develops properly often. And when we look at this network in somebody with chronic early life trauma, often we see that it looks like the default mode network of a child that's seven to nine years old. And uh, we have suggested here that this is why, you know, we may have sort of an arrest in the developmental trajectory of this network under conditions of stress and early life trauma which really underlies the lack of development of a sense of self. So it's a network that is critical to the continued experience of the self across time and into the future. And I wanna look a little bit at this in more detail here. So the back of the network really helps us with recalling past experience, whereas the front of the network helps us also to see a future and to see things in context in which they occur and really allows for that introspection and knowing what we feel around different things. And so it's really underlying the continued experience of self across time and into the future. And of course, when we think about trauma, this is something that people often have difficulties with. They're stuck in the past, there is no present and there is no future or the present and the future have become the past. There only is a past, there is no present and there's no future. So let's look at the default mode network at rest or off task when individuals aren't doing anything, when they're just lying in the scanner with their eyes closed and we're tracking what networks are most active. So what happens to this default mode network? And in the top of the screen here, we see a normal default mode network in healthy individuals. And we see that the back is connected to the front, is connected to the parietal lobes. And so we have a continuous experience of the self from the past into the future. When we look at individuals with PTSD related to early life trauma, we see that the network is very different, right? We lack connections with the front, with the embodiment parts, and we have connection in the back part is dealing with the past. So essentially we're stuck in the past without a future. We don't have to be neuroscientists to realize that this network is very different compared to the network of healthy individuals. But what happens under threat? So when people are exposed to reminders of their own trauma, for example, what happens to the default mode network? And this is something that really surprised our group at first because what we saw was the only time there was some connection of this network was under threat. And you can see this here. These are conditions where people were exposed to memories of their trauma, words of their traumas. And so they were triggered, they were un they felt under threat, and all of a sudden we started seeing this network show some connection, not full connection, but some connection. And so what does this mean? And what drives this connection of this network under threat became questions that we really wanted to ask in our group. 
And so what we found was that the reptilian brain was driving the connectivity of this network under threat. And specifically the periaqueductal gray, which is part of the reptilian brain was driving the connectivity. So what do we know about the periaqueductal gray? It's critical in autonomic regulation. So it mediates the sympathetic <coughs> as well as the parasympathetic nervous system. So it can lead to increases or decreases in heart rate or to active or passive defensive responses, depending on what really increases survival during threat. But it's also critical in primary emotional systems. And this is work done by Yak Pangsep. And so he's shown that something that animals and humans have in common is that we experience these raw affective experiences as part of seven different emotional systems, which include play, panic, rage, fear, care, lust, and seeking. So these are all raw emotional systems that originate in the periaqueductal gray, in the reptilian brain, and then connect with higher parts of the brain to, uh, in humans, make us conscious of the feeling, make us able to communicate our feelings to others. But it's really the raw emotional experience that is the beginning of affective and emotional experience. And again, when we think about our traumatized clients, it's often this raw emotion that people are troubled by, right? This raw emotion haunts them and they experience it as visceral sensations in their body. And it's very hard to treat because it's such a visceral sensation. And so if we only intervene at the level of the cortex, often our clients come in and they tell us, you know, I know this wasn't my fault, but I can't stop feeling it. So we would hypothesize that if we have a client, you know, who says that it's really the periaqueductal gray that's still driving a lot of the visceral distress. And so in PTSD under threat, this periaqueductal gray that really drives trauma related arousal and raw affect connects to and drives the connectivity of this default mode network. And so again, as we just talked about, the periaqueductal gray mediates physiological arousal and raw affect associated with the trauma. And the default mode network, of course, mediates how we view ourselves in this world. And so under threat, these two become coupled, right? Under traumatic conditions, trauma-related arousal and affect becomes coupled with how we see ourselves in this world. And to clinicians who work in the trauma field, that is of course no surprise because that's what we deal with on a daily basis. And so what happens is that trauma related affect and arousal influences who we are in this world. And so I think here we really have to push back at the Cartesian fallacy that has, you know, I think slowed down the field for years. I think, therefore I am. And I think we have to put it on its head and really think about it's I feel, therefore I am. And it's those feelings that are driving our thoughts, how and our self-related perspectives and how we see us ourselves in this world. So I feel, therefore I am. And I think this is really influencing our patients as well, right? It's their feelings and that's how they see themselves in the aftermath of trauma. And so I think trauma really becomes central to one's identity, right? And it's the feelings that are really driving that. And this also has, I think, big implications for reckless behavior and reckless behavior of all different forms. 
So when we first saw this network becoming connected under conditions of threat, I showed it to a trauma survivor who's since recovered. And I said, you know, this is what we're finding. And we're really a bit confused about this. What comes to mind for you? And this is what she said. I started shoplifting when I was five. I shoplifted well into my adulthood at great risk to me were I to be caught. It was confusing why I did this. It was so, so risky. I knew that. But I think the adrenaline organized me, rising, it seemed, from my belly, through my brain, from the back to the front. I felt my feet. I knew my hands and fingers. I had eyes. I was agency. It lit me up. It was essential. At five and still at 50, I didn't exist to myself except as that artful dodger. At these moments, I existed. All of me in the act of stealing, I would come online. So under this threat, under this hyper arousal that preceded the stealing, that default mode network, that I, that sense of self would come online. And that's the only time it came online. It did not come online in the absence of threat. So are these reckless behaviors a way of feeling alive for our clients? And we often see this in our veterans. We see this in our clients with childhood trauma who engage in prostitution, right? And domestic violence. Is this a way of feeling alive? But is this, is this also the only way they can connect? Right, and again, remember the default mode network is also critical for social connection. So is this also a way of maintaining the relationship with the perpetrator who you rely on for connection and who only is your only means of, of connection? And so what I think is emerging here is really preliminary evidence that underlies the compulsion to repeat the trauma. That was already discussed by Sigmund Freud, but that Bessel van der Kolk and many others have written about. And that is so core to our patients, right? That compulsion to repeat the trauma keeps them stuck and makes us frustrated as therapists. And I think beginning to have a neurobiological mechanism to help explain this will decrease the stigma and really help increase the empathy and guide treatments to what we can do to overcome this. And I think this is really at the core of what we need to change in treatment and of course, including with neurofeedback. So it's really about getting the self back into a healthy rhythm. And so we've talked about how the default mode network is the dominant network of the resting brain. And so now let's start talking and relating the default mode network to brain frequencies and how the two fit together. We know that the alpha waves, so eight to 12 Hertz oscillation, the alpha rhythm have also been shown to be the dominant electrical activity of the resting brain. So in terms of brain networks, it's the default mode network that's the dominant network. And in terms of frequencies, it's the alpha rhythm that's the dominant frequency of the resting brain. So how are those two related? And studies are now showing us, you know, a good association between alpha oscillations and default mode network activity and connectivity. And it's being shown more and more now that it's the alpha rhythms that are likely organizing the connectivity of the default mode network. And of course, we also know although we need a lot more work on this, that PTSD is associated with alpha abnormalities. And usually people with post-traumatic stress have low alpha. And this may be one mechanism underlying this very disconnected default mode network 
and this lack of a sense of self in trauma. So let's talk about how we can work with the alpha rhythm as an adjunct, as an adjunct treatment for post-traumatic stress. And here, I just wanna give two clinical scenarios before I get into the brain data, because I think there's some beautiful examples of what this form of neurofeedback can do for individuals. I wanna say here right away, this is of course not the only form of neurofeedback, it, it just happens one form that we're studying, but there's many other protocols, the T4P4, for example, that Seaburn, Ed Hamlin, and many have used you know, for many decades in trauma. There's the alpha theta, so this is just one protocol that we chose to study. You know, there's uh, two other protocols that also have been shown to be effective through RCTs, but of course, we also have lots of clinical evidence that support the use of other protocols. But I wanna give two examples from the alpha neurofeedback because that's what we're focusing on today. So of course, when we think about uh, the restoration of the self, Affect regulation is at the core. And of course, this is what Seaburn always focuses on and the importance of affect regulation after neurofeedback. And this is one woman who was uh, seeing uh, a psychotherapist for combined psychotherapy and neurofeedback. And she did a number of different protocols, but she also did quite a number of alpha down sessions. So this is what she said. During the last week, I had come across a very lonely and desperate place from which the navigation out was tricky. When I was informed that visitors were to arrive soon, I felt very panicky and anxious. This is not very unusual. I normally find a way out there and then manage to endure the best that I can do, the idle chatter for two hours, which seems to be my limit. Then I need to find a way out. Yesterday, I realized that I was not going to be able to do at least that. Hiding in my bedroom was not an acceptable option and wouldn't bring relief either. I needed to shift out of that state and on my own, I couldn't, not for lack of trying. So I did a 15 minute alpha down training session. There was once again, immediate relief, not just relief, the discomfort was gone. The desperation was gone. The rumination and obsessive judgmental inner chatter had stopped. I did not feel anxious or afraid. I was lucid and calm, and I was able to make rational and collective plans. With the visitors, there was a three-year-old that had a tantrum that got a bit out of the hand. I observed this and could see the dynamics. With the permission of the parents, I engaged and calmed him down within a very short period of time. I had explained before how I find hosting dinners, et cetera, very daunting and avoided as far as possible. As I had done once before after an alpha down training session, I invited the people to stay for dinner. It is as unusual as unusual can be. I engaged in conversation without effort. So a beautiful example of, you know, somebody who really uh, gained increased affect regulation with the use of alpha neurofeedback in combination with psychotherapy and other forms of neurofeedback as well. Then I wanna give you an example from the same woman. Um, and here she talks about something that I think as a field, we don't talk enough about. And I think Seaburn, you're the only one who really talks about this. And this is this yearning, this incredible gut-wrenching yearning for a caregiver. And I think it's something that needs to be much more at the forefront of our consciousness because I think a lot of our patients are torn apart by this incredible yearning. And so this woman, again, describes her experience of this yearning in relationship to alpha neurofeedback. And she said, after three minutes of alpha down, I started feeling a strange and uncomfortable physical sensation. I had difficulty describing it at first because it was unlike anything I was familiar with. Afterwards, I figured out 
that it was an awareness of my entire body that happened, which prior to that always had been very fragmented, like much else. I stopped after four minutes. Then when my physical discomfort lifted, the desperate yearning was gone, not less intense, it was gone. And she goes on to describe, I won't read that for the sake of time now, but this yearning was really gone for her and she reflects further about it. And I think this is something we need to think about in terms of outcome of trauma treatment much more as well. So let's talk about some early studies of alpha neurofeedback just to uh, get some foundation. And then we'll talk about uh, the most recent findings. So when we first started doing alpha down, so we basically suppress eight to 12 Hertz, we were interested in what people were experiencing. We just, uh, gave them a computer game, usually the spaceship moving forward. We didn't give them any instruction. And usually very quickly, they were able to decrease their alpha. And so at the beginning, and of course we have uh, continued to be very curious what people experience while they decrease their alpha rhythm. And so in our initial study done by Rosie Kluch and Thomas Ross, we studied 21 subjects and 17 out of 21 told us that they felt a sense of control and reported feeling more relaxed, calm and clear minded. Eight out of 21 reported feeling greater fatigue, but a good kind of fatigue like after yoga, for example, one person experienced mild drowsiness and three reported feeling frustrated when they weren't able to make the spaceship move ahead. And they employed several strategies, including focused visual attention. Some started experiment, uh, experimenting, bringing up positive emotions, and some even brought up trauma-related memories and found that when they brought up the trauma-related memories, they didn't become as upset anymore. And overall, we saw a significant increase in calmness that we measured with their scale after uh, one session of alpha neurofeedback. And what was also very surprising to us early on was that people were able to decrease their alpha during session. And then towards the end of the session, what we found was a rebound effect that then they actually have had increased alpha. And again, remember that PTSD is associated with too little alpha. And so we're decreasing their alpha, but then people are having a rebound, right? So very slowly over time, we're actually increasing their alpha. And this is gonna be very important for this talk today. And so what uh, is happening here? What we're really seeing is this alpha rebound effect. And we think this is related to homeostatic neuroplasticity. So basically, we're changing the brain in a way that it can find its own new steady state and it can titrate that, right? It's up to the brain how much the alpha goes up over time, you know, how much can that brain handle? And so it's finding a new steady state and it's really determined by the by the brain. And so it's really working on the brain's self-tuning capacity to return to a new steady state. And often, you know, by pushing the system in one direction, then allows the system actually to recalibrate in the other direction. So the next uh, study we did was a randomized controlled trial of alpha neurofeedback. And here we uh, compared, you know, suppressing eight to 12 Hertz. So decreasing alpha to a sham control. And this is where people got feedback about somebody else's brain. <clears throat> <clears throat> 
And so people had 20 weekly sessions of alpha down and they had an fMRI scan before and after treatment. And then we also had a three month follow-up session. And in addition to the fMRI, people also had EEGs before and after treatment. So we can track the brain networks, but also the brain frequencies associated with neurofeedback. You all know how neurofeedback works, so we don't need this slide today. And so this is a, a slide showing that uh, people in the experimental group, so in the red group, compared to the sham group, which is the blue group, that they actually decrease their alpha during the sessions. And this is important to show that people are actually doing what you want the neurofeedback to do. And of course the sham, when you're getting feedback from another EEG, you know, from another EEG, from another person, they're not suppressing the alpha. It's only the people who get the feedback about their own brain that are suppressing the alpha. And what we saw was that there was really a significant decrease in PTSD uh, symptom scores. And after the neurofeedback, not the sham, 61% of people had remission from PTSD. So they no longer met criteria. We also had no dropouts in that condition. And the effect size is about one. So it's comparable to the gold standard treatments for post-traumatic stress. So, you know, a really promising effect. And what was also interesting is that we could change some of those major networks, including the sense of self, the default mode network. And so what you see here, this is after neurofeedback, we see less connectivity in the past part of the default mode network. So maybe the past has calmed down a little bit, but we see increased connectivity in red here with the, the front part of the network that's so disconnected. And so we're hypothesizing that this sense of self network is slowly coming online after neurofeedback. We're also seeing effects in other networks, for example, the salience network that helps us to know what's most salient inside as well as in the environment. And that network is often overactive in post-traumatic stress and has been suggested to be associated with hypervigilance because everything becomes salient. And so this network shows a slight decrease in connectivity after neurofeedback. And this may be related to the fact that people are no longer as hypervigilant. And what's interesting after sham treatment, so after the fake neurofeedback, we see no differences in uh, network connectivity. So that's really specific to the alpha neurofeedback. But now we also want to look at oscillations, right? So we've now looked at how we can restore some brain networks after neurofeedback, especially the sense of self network, how that starts to become uh, more connected. But we also want to know what's happening to the alpha rhythm, right? Because as we've talked about earlier, it's the alpha rhythm that may be critical in helping this default mode network connect. So what happens with the alpha rhythm. And I would hypothesize that we're really with the neurofeedback bringing online frequencies that help us to connect to ourselves as well as to others. So to really be in synchrony with ourselves, the world and the world around us. So let's look at when we compare before neurofeedback, the how much alpha there is in post-traumatic stress compared to individuals who haven't been traumatized. So this is replicating what's in the literature. Blue shows less than individuals who haven't been traumatized. 
So PTSD patients really have significantly less alpha, both in the front of the brain as well as in the back of the brain. So everything blue means less alpha. <clears throat> so this is before neurofeedback. So a really profoundly different level of alpha in post-traumatic stress than in healthy individuals. And what we see after neurofeedback, the yellow signifies an increase in alpha. And look where that is. It's the front part of the self network, the default mode network. So after neurofeedback, alpha comes online, you know, where we had significantly less alpha, all of a sudden the alpha comes online after neurofeedback, but not after sham. So only after neurofeedback. And so we're hypothesizing that this increase in alpha in the front part of the self network helps that, that network reconnect and restore the sense of self after treatment. So again, here we start to see an increase in alpha emerge after treatment where those significant decreases were found. So we're bringing online frequencies that help us to connect to ourselves and the world around us. And we're hypothesizing that this alpha down neurofeedback, which was administered at PZ, so at the back, right over the back part of the sense of self network, now really helps to increase the connectivity to the front part of the network by increasing the alpha. So that alpha is really critical to the connectivity of the sense of self network and the restoration of the self. So we're talking about restoring the sense of self or bringing it online sometimes for the first time in the aftermath of developmental trauma. And so we're really able to move from the traumatized self where this default mode network was so disconnected to the recovered self. So where we start to see reconnection of this network. And we're starting to see that the brain frequencies, of course, are very much related to the connectivity of the brain. So this network is now starting to be in synchrony. The back and the front part of this network is starting to be in synchrony and it is really bringing the rhythm of a healthy sense of self at rest that's not under threat online, right? This is at rest and it's showing us that we can restore the sense of self at rest and that it does no longer just need threat to be online, which I think is very exciting. So these are the, the uh, results from the randomized control trial in a nutshell. And of course, something that's really uh, important and needs to be at the forefront of our thinking in neurofeedback is how do we disseminate neurofeedback at the same time as we collect more research, of course? How do we disseminate neurofeedback? And here I was very excited to see that a group in Rwanda had actually uh, replicated the alpha down protocol with uh, affordable wearable uh, EEG equipment. And I was very excited. They uh, also replicated this alpha rebound effect so that low alpha uh, slowly normalized and that people had this rebound effect and that their PTSD symptoms improved significantly. So I thought that was very exciting to see. And also how can we bring neurofeedback to special populations, right? How do, can we disseminate neurofeedback among special populations? And of course, indigenous populations are incredibly important here 
because they have suffered such tremendous intergenerational transmission of trauma. And so I was very lucky to get a phone call from Patricia Vickers uh, several years ago. And Patricia is a wonderful uh, therapist working in British Columbia in Canada, so on the West Coast. She's from the Haida Gwaii Nation. And you can see an image here, so a beautiful piece of uh, Northern British Columbia. And Patricia really is very experienced in the integrative treatment of trauma. She has many modalities that she uses, but importantly also Patricia had her own journey with neurofeedback. So Patricia suffered from complex trauma, which she speaks openly about, and she had a wonderful journey with neurofeedback herself. And so she thought it was time to bring neurofeedback to her own people. And uh, she's completed one project with the Haida Gwaii people in Northern British Columbia. And she's now already moving on to her second project in a different community, bringing neurofeedback as part of integrative trauma treatment. And of course, also including many traditional indigenous healing practices. And I think this makes it uh, so powerful as you'll see in a moment. So I think what we need to talk here about is really Canada's very dark past of how indigenous peoples were treated, especially when it comes to the residential schools, but not exclusively to the residential schools. And so this, these statistics here are really shocking. And so the odds of dying for children in Indian residential schools is one in 25. And the odds of dying for Canadians serving in World War II was one in 26. And recently, uh, this has really come to light more. This information was really hidden for many, many years. And recently, many uh, graves of Indigenous children have been discovered in Canada. And uh, I think we've recovered over 5,000 dead children now, predominantly from these residential schools. So it's really a huge problem that plagues our country to the present day. And so the intergenerational trauma in these populations is really horrific. And so they're so deserving of good treatment and not only good treatment, I think we also have a lot to learn from the indigenous populations because I think they so understand community sense of belonging, connection with the supernatural, all these things that have been lost in our culture that I think is very much contributing to our increased rates of mental illness. So we have so much to learn from these populations. And I think collaboration is gonna be such an important uh, way moving forward. And so this is uh, what Patricia shared with me. Before I said, you know, I was giving this talk today and I said, you know, can you write me a paragraph of what you experienced with the alpha down? And so this is what she said. Neurofeedback alpha down has proven to be a gentle method that supports the client to see their capacity as they watch their brain in action on an iPad screen. I have witnessed profound change in clients through attending neurofeedback sessions for 30 minutes twice a week. So it's intense. And anybody who has done alpha down knows that 30 minutes of alpha down twice a week is very intense. Then Patricia goes on to say, clients who choose to process traumatic childhood memories, I also combine somatic experiencing and deep brain reorienting. So she really does a combination of the neurofeedback, but also trauma processing. And she says their integration was smooth, natural, and deep. They then take their healing further by speaking to community members about their awakenings, learnings and healing without blame, judgment or criticism towards their caregivers. So it's very much a healing in community you know, a healing that goes on between them and their therapist, Patricia, but then a healing that's taken to the community, which I think is incredibly important. 
the combination of cultural wisdom through ceremony, song, and language has been the foundation for intergenerational healing and a bright contrast to our history of atrocities. So this is Patricia's experience. And these are some of the things that individuals have told her. And so I'll just give you some quotes. One person said, I don't overreact. I used to slam the door to make a point, but I see that doesn't help. Another person said, I never realized how much anxiety I had and I can now see it and tell myself I'm okay. Another person said, I lost it the other week and couldn't stop crying. My family didn't know what to do. I went for a long drive and sat in a field until I felt better. And another person said, before I would be terrified when the power went out, when I had to get up in the middle of the night in the pitch dark, but now I can go back to bed without lighting a candle. And the last person said, I'm generally calmer. I can remember my childhood with less anxiety. So some beautiful accounts. I also had the honor of meeting some of the people who completed Patricia's uh, really integrative treatment. And it was wonderful to hear their experiences. And what I really learned during that session was how deep seated internal oppre internalized oppression really is. You know, I came into the session, you know, really wanting to learn. And I said, you know, I'm so curious to learn from you. And two of the people said to me, what would you want to learn from an Indian? And I thought, wow, how sad, right? How deep seated that internalized oppression. But uh, both uh, Surab Shah and I are going to go and visit uh, the community where Patricia administered the treatment. And this is part of the indigenous practice of doing uh, an intervention and research, and they're going to share their experiences. So I very much look forward to that. We also have some preliminary results uh, with the alpha rhythms. And again, you know, we used mind lift for this experiment. So we don't have, you know, obviously sophisticated EEGs, but in the first cohort, Patricia saw 20 individuals and 14 completed the 20 sessions. And the ones who completed the 20 sessions really had a biphasic alpha pattern. So their alpha went up early and then they would process the trauma and while they did that, it came down a little bit again, and then it went up again. And there were also six non-completers that didn't feel that they were able to do this work at this time. And what was interesting is that they did not show this biphasic alpha pattern. So we're still in the process of looking at these data closer, but I think it's really interesting that, you know, we have the first person experience in people's own language, and we also have some brain data and to combine that I think is really exciting. Where do we go in the future? I think, uh, and Mariana, we talked about this with Seaburn and many others at the Neurofeedback Summit a few weeks ago. We certainly need randomized controlled trials and real life evidence, right? And we need a lot more in the field of neurofeedback. And we really need to develop an evidence-based for a personalized approach to neurofeedback, right? We really need some evidence that we can say what protocol works for whom and when, right? So we can come up with an evidence-based decision tree. And I think we really need to keep working on disseminating neurofeedback to special populations and also combining neurofeedback with other trauma treatments. And you'll hear from Heather Hargraves later on today about how this may be done with psychedelics. And then we also really need to, to support our training programs. And Mirjana, you have one of those wonderful uh, training programs. And these are exactly the kind of programs uh, we need so we can train more trauma clinicians to do neurofeedback as an adjunct treatment for post-traumatic stress. But I think it's a very exciting time in this field. Uh, we have a lot to learn. We've 
I have to be grateful for many pioneers in neurofeedback, including Seaburn, Ed Hamlin, and many others, you know, whose shoulders we can really stand on. And on that note, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Ruth, thank you so yes. much. This was an amazing presentation. You brought soul to research. It's something that I didn't believe could happen. But, but you know, that is, that's deep, deep knowledge, understanding of, of work with trauma, understanding your patients. Uh, you're a clinician in, in your heart. And I am. <laughs> How you combine all of this is just, it's such a delight to hear. I, you know, I never really, I'm doing some research, but I never enjoyed to listen about research as I did with your presentation. And work with the indigenous community is really inspiring. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And Patricia is so inspiring. Um, is it possible to ask some questions, Mariana? Yes, we have 15 minutes. Oh, great. Okay. Ruth, so that's a, a very important um, uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I work with um, yeah, a lot of kids who have been traumatized and people and adults. Um, uh, also aware of the uh, a lot of publications recently in, uh, about alpha top-down regulation in the, in the uh, meditation as well. Um, yeah. But the, um, my only concern is... Um, 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 the uh, um, I, I know that down training alpha can cause a reaction, and uh, I think it's very important to uh, report all the um, uh, side effects of any 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 approach. Uh, and um, sometimes in some in, uh, traumatized individuals, there's too much alpha, so they got an opposite um, situation. Absolutely, I'm so, so glad you bring that up. <coughs> Yeah, and so yes, um, absolutely. It's, it's so, so you go ahead. Yeah, so uh, absolutely. I think the alpha down protocol really needs to be titrated because uh, it can lead to increased awareness, right? And if that's not titrated, you know, with the increased awareness, people can become destabilized. And so I think that's really critical for uh, therapists to know. And I always say, you know, when you're doing neurofeedback, you almost have to be a better therapist because things change quicker. And so you really have to be ready to help the individual integrate whatever comes up. I have a case example that I've talked about many times. I didn't have time to show it today where a woman I had seen for many years did four sessions of alpha neurofeedback and she actually describes ramming back into her body and for the first time ever experiencing all these emotions. And it really was an identity crisis for her. And, uh, you know, we really had to work with her to incorporate those new feelings. And she was able to do that because, you know, I had seen her for many years and she had the skills available. And so I think we have to be aware of that with the alpha down protocol. You know, there's other protocols we can combine as well. We don't have to do alpha down, but it's certainly something to be aware of. And thanks for bringing that up. Thank you very much, Ruth. It would be interesting to collaborate. Um, for all, yeah, it would be important, I think, for all of us to collaborate in, um, in um, using your appro this approach and um, um, and also share how we manage the reactions. Thanks very much. Absolutely. Absolutely. We have Terry and Martin, but I would like also Seaburn to comment after that. Seaburn, if that's okay with you. Oh, hi, Ruth. Thanks very much for that presentation. Very interesting. I was wondering, it, it's obviously done with eyes open if you're looking at an iPad. Is that, is that yes. correct? Yes. Eyes, eyes open. Yes, it is. Yep, okay. And so I'm wondering, how does that compare with, say, Alpha Theta training? Have you done any comparisons with Alpha Theta training? No, we haven't. You know, this is so time consuming, all this research. And, you know, the way we measure outcomes, which is with the PTSD scale, you know, if we did head to head comparisons, I wouldn't 
I expect to find anything on the PTSD measures. I would expect to find things probably in terms of subjective experience. But right now we're still limited to, you know, really having to show a change in PTSD symptoms. And so I don't think that would be a fruitful approach if, if what I say makes sense. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Martin. Okay, um, I have two questions. The first one, you mentioned that PTSD clients tend to have lower alpha. So does it refer to alpha magnitude in eyes open or eyes closed? Eyes closed and eyes open, I believe. But uh, I, this was from the gentleman uh, to, who asked the first question. This is something that also needs to be explored more. So in general, I think the alpha power is low, but as of course we also see during dissociative states, the alpha can be very high, right? Especially in the front part of the brain. And so I think an avenue for future research that's really important is to really figure out, you know, when is the alpha up also, which can certainly occur in individuals who are highly dissociative. So I think this will be a very important uh, field for the future. Um, you showed those uh, beautiful brains with blue and then after um, neurofeedback, I assume when you say after neurofeedback means after completing a certain number of sessions, correct? Or is that after a session? So you, you yes. showed those gray and No, that blue, is after. Those gray and blue brains, um, was that eyes open or was that eyes closed? Yes, yeah, so that was after 20 sessions of neurofeedback and that was after eyes, an EEG during eyes closed. Okay, and my second question is about the training protocol. What exactly is the montage and what exactly is the methodology of training that alpha down? Yeah, so we use the eager system. Uh, the electrode is on PZ and then the two on the ear. And then we, uh, we suppress eight to 12 Hertz. So you're saying no it's PZ inhibits. minus linked ears, yeah? Yeah. And we inhibit eight to 12. And what do you use as, as the feedback modality? So uh, for most patients, if they had a choice between two, it was either Pac-Man or the spaceship moving forward. The, sp the spaceship uh, game. Uh, do you think it would also work with movies? I'm sure it would. We just, you know, we use the eager software And, uh, you know, we wanted to give the individual a little bit of choice because, you know, somebody may have been triggered by one of the paradigms. So we wanted to have another choice. And so when we, you know, when you do a study, you want as little variability as possible. But, you know, I, I don't see why videos, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't work. This is just okay. what we had available at the time. And um, you say eight to 12 hertz down what reward percentage would you achieve or aim for? 65%. And any inhibits, high beta or anything? No, just eight to 12. Thank you. I would Thank like you. Can we have Sieber to comment and then we have a few more questions. Well, this was wonderful. I hope you're feeling better. Um, uh, I um, I just had first I had a question, which was about uh, blue and gray brain. Also, you saw an increase in alpha frontally. What are you seeing in the back? Is that normalizing in the back? Is that averaging in the back? There's no blue in your diagram. Do you know what's going on in the back part? Yes, that's also normalizing in the back. 
Okay. Yeah, so that's also saying, normalizing. Okay. Yeah. But it's not it's not rising in statistics to look yellow yet. Is that what's happening? No, not yet. Okay. I'll send you the paper. It's we're just uh, revising it. I'll send it to you. Okay. Okay. Um, the, on uh, you know what what I'm seeing or what I've seen in uh, in developmental trauma, and this could be different than uh, battlefield PTSD. That's another distinction we have to make in terms of alpha abnormalities. Um, I've seen uh, excess alpha in some uh, people with PTSD, but mostly, as you're saying, uh, low amounts of alpha. And, um, and both normalize, if I'm right, when you're doing alpha down, you've seen normalization in both conditions, right? My, my hunch Absolutely, is, and Thomas Ross published. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead, Seabird, yeah. We're, we're bouncing no, no, from ahead. Australia back to Canada and back here. Okay. Um, so what I, what I think, you know, what my speculation is, is that there is uh, that, that some people seem to have sort of a compensatory alpha that, and that it bringing it down that this may be the, I, I don't know, we'd have to see, but my, what I would wonder is if bringing down compensatory alpha is when you get in trouble, right? And what, what part of that signal is compensatory? So in high alpha, that's what I think is going on. I don't, we don't have another explanation for it. So it's a reasonable <laughs> explanation. And when you bring down compensatory alpha, yeah, anywhere, C4, T4, T4, P4, what you're going, what I see anyway, is people becoming anxious. It's, you can try to correct what looks abnormal in the brain, but it's not a great idea emotionally uh, if it's compensatory <laughs> alpha, right? The other thing I just wanted to say in terms of, of, uh, of high alpha that is dissociation is that in I have seen brains in flashback. I've 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 been training people who have had flashbacks. Not a, not not so many to make it too too big a plural number, but there have been a, a, a few that I've seen. And in every situation, I think Mariana talked about this too, what we're seeing is the slow wave is pushing the alpha. The alpha is almost just riding the, the delta and the theta, uh, which is where the big action is in the brain in the dissociative, uh, at least in the in the flashback condition, or in the sudden dissociative condition, even without a flashback, where you where you start to see a lot of excess slow wave, and so it's almost like the alpha isn't alpha. It's it's I mean it you know you know what I'm saying. It's like it's riding. The whole brain is now in much higher amplitudes and it's sort of riding on the top of those other waveforms. So those are my, those are my thoughts. When called upon in class, you know, like, it's like <laughs> those are my thoughts. Thanks, Ivan. Yeah. In our practice, we do an event-related potential study and um, the most common neuromarker for trauma, it we see is uh, elevation of alpha T6, and, uh, and also uh, frontal, um, sometimes frontal often changes in the uh, um, midline theta, um, mm -hmm. the anterior cingulate. So the temporal lobe seems like um, one of the most um, um, important um, um, feature in, the, uh, in trauma. It's maybe related to amygdala, and so we probably need to. I, I know P44 helps uh, big time, but sometimes I, I need to work directly with G6 and uh, O2 is to calm down the amygdala, mm -hmm. and, and also FP2 to, um, to calm down the emotional reactivity. Yeah, and of course, temporal lobe is also embodiment, right? Which uh, I think is so important. So, yeah, it's really interesting. Interesting. Can I yep. ask a question now? Yes. Yep. We have Dennis, Mark, and then we have one yep. in chat to answer, and then we'll run out of time. Yeah, I've normally uh, used the alpha uh, theta protocol with eyes closed. Um, it seems paradoxical that what we want the alpha um, to go up, 
uh, and we're training it down. And so, I mean, I understand that there's a kind of a rebound effect. I, I'd like to get some better idea about what's uh, what's the mechanism going on in the uh, in the, in that rebound, and also um, what is the experience of someone who's um, got low alpha and they're training down the alpha uh, for for ultimately it to rebound, but what's their experience emotionally while they're training it down? What are they, you know? Yeah, that's a great question. And usually what we see is, you know, the, uh, they have an easy time decreasing the alpha. Um, sometimes they experiment bringing up positive emotion or even trauma related material and it doesn't seem to be very disturbing to them but what's what i see clinically uh, which is really associated with the rebound effect i see a fatigue and so people you know repeatedly report you know that they're starting to get tired and i always say to the patient you know the length of the session is determined by you Right. So you need to check in with your body and you need to know, you know, is this enough or do we do another set? And almost invariably, this fatigue sets in. And, you know, I can when I see the alpha creeping up, I know, OK, I'm, I'm pretty sure they're going to say I'm a bit fatigued now. Let's leave it at that for today. And so that's something clinically I've uh, repeatedly observed. Um, what I observed with one of my clients who has dissociative identity disorder, after she had done a few uh, alpha down sessions, what I could really uh, observe was that she moved away from switching and she was able to have enough reflective capacity and top down emotion regulation capacity to prevent her from switching. That was really interesting as well. But the fatigue, I would say, is the most consistent uh, clinical symptom I, I see associated with the rebound. Uh, and so if their alpha is down and uh, the, in the pr protocol, they train it down even further, in, mm -hmm. in, in that, do they experience uh, more traumatic, uh, more trauma or, or is it more repressed? I would say neither. Mm -hmm. ah, That's not something I observe. And I've trained alpha down with individuals who had very, very low alpha. And what I see over time is that the alpha starts to normalize. It starts to creep up very slowly. So, so what it's more like it's um, increasing the flexibility in the whole frequency yeah. band in the brain. It's like a yeah. chiropractic adjustment exactly yeah you, right you're you're suppressing it and that allows it to then recalibrate right, right? It, right. it unsticks it from being stuck in a certain state it unsticks it because you're making it more mobile getting it unstuck, and then it yeah, yeah. okay yeah right <laughs> thanks Okay, we have Thanks. time for the last question, Mark, and then just one online, the one that I was sent in chat, and we have to keep going with our program. Thanks. Hi, Ruth. Um, I think Dennis has probably mostly covered the question I was going to have, which was what was the reasoning behind suppressing alpha if it was already low? Um, but that's, I think you've answered that pretty much there. Was there an actual did you have a reason behind, let's go for suppressing something when we actually want it to increase? Yeah, so there were two reasons we chose alpha. One was because of its relationship to the default mode network. And Thomas Ross had a lot of experience with alpha down and he found that it was very easy uh, to learn by different participants. And then when he came to the lab, I actually tried the alpha down and, you know, it was sort of a really stressful day for me. My mind was really busy 
And after the alpha down, my mind really cleared. And I thought, wow, you know, this may be a very helpful paradigm. So I think those different uh, pieces together led us to do the alpha down. And then right. while we were doing the mechanistic studies, I was using it clinically with some of my most severely ill people. And I observed this rebound effect over and over again, which we also observed in the mechanistic studies. And so that kind of evolved and uh, taught us, you know, about this homeostatic uh, neuroplasticity. So you're shaking it out of a stuck place and enabling the alpha band to better regulate itself. Yeah. yeah. And the brain to titrate its regulation, which I love. Yeah, yeah. Like like Seaburn was saying, I'm, I've seen quite a few people with uh, have elevated alpha with PTSD, and um, it does seem like some sort of protective mechanism to, it's almost like they're skating along the surface with that alpha. They don't want to drop down into theta. They don't want to go to the subconscious where those memories are stored. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think this is going to be a really important thing to figure out in the future. Mm. Thanks for that. Yeah, I always explain to my clients that um, alpha is like a gating function. It's like a neutral gear. So if some people um, go too fast and the um, the the gearbox is not functioning, it's near to fine tuning. Um, so learning to stop at the traffic light uh, and stay on the neutral while your engine is still running, and then um, some people. They have, um, uh, they can't um, uh, shift the gear to actually start driving. So that's where we, I think, the one of the um, good story for explaining how alpha works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very nice analogy. And we now really run over time, Ruth. We could go keep going now for hours. And, and there are a few questions that Sebron answered. And if there's any that is not, then we'll just send them to you, Ruth, and then distribute to sure. our participants. Thank you so much for being with us today. You know, we're always learning from you, and you're inspiring us. Well, thank you for having me, Mariana. It's always a pleasure to be with you and with everybody else. Thank you.